Um, I have been in China for about three and a half years. The first couple of years I lived in uh, Kunming, where I met Hans, I was studying. After I had a little bit of uh, Chinese under my belt, I moved down into the, these villages, uh, which I'm going to uh, tell you about. And what I'm going to share with you is just my experiences. I, you know, you can't say that you're an expert in China uh, if you've only been there for three and a half years. There's a saying that goes, if you've been in China one week, you can write a magazine article. If you're in China for a month, you can write a book about China. If you're in China for longer than a year, you can't say anything at all. And that's how I feel about living in China. There's so many things, and it's so different and so varied that it's very difficult. Another, another thing uh, that I want to say before I start is um, a warning that my wife told me that um, she reminded me of a story just after we got married. I was uh, talking about her family in a little bit of a critical way. And as a mother bear protects its young, I saw my beautiful young bride uh, defend her family. And I did not know what I had married or what was going to become of me. And I use that just as a uh, preface to what I'm saying, that I am a foreigner to China. Uh, it is not the purpose that I am going to degrade the Chinese government. Uh, I don't know a lot of government officials, but the government officials that I work with closely are my friends. So in no way am I trying to say that uh, they're lazy bums or, or anything different, actually, than I am. Uh, I can identify with a lot of their emotions. Most of the people that I work with are people who live in the community. Their mothers, their grandfathers, their children, their grandchildren live in the community and they want what's best uh, for their community. Let me do a little bit of advertising. I work for a small company which was actually started by a friend of mine. I was at university working at a uh, UC Riverside, and a friend of mine invited me to come overseas, leave behind the academic dream of being a professor and working in the ivory tower, and do something significant with my life. And so I took him up on that, and I joined uh, Partners in Hope, which is a nonprofit organization. Our hope is to reach out to the poor and downcast scattered among the terraced hills of Yunnan and just to help them uh, to develop. Our purpose is not just to throw money at a situation, but to help provide long-term help. And that's just going to come through long-term change. So really, our ultimate goal is to influence the way that people think that leads to poverty. <coughs> And again, I just want to be careful here. I'm not talking about bringing democracy uh, to, the, to China. Uh, I don't think democracy works, actually, in China. It's just not uh, that sort of a, a, a cultural system. But what I'm talking about is meeting people one-on-one -on -one and telling them, you can change if you try hard. You know, there's a lot of people, even uh, some of us, and, and, and sometimes myself, we have what's called a scarcity mentality. There's not enough. There's not enough. I can't do it. I can't do it. But, you know, I think our Creator has given us enough. And I, wanted, I want to encourage people to have hope that if they try hard, they work hard, even if it, their life is not better, they can make their uh, children's lives better. And so that's our goal. We want to provide hope to people, and hence the name Partners in Hope. We, don't, we can't manufacture hope. Hope doesn't come from throwing money at situations, but we want to help and work with people to give them hope. The philosophy of our company is to go to the people, to live with them, to learn from them, and to love them. To start with what they know and build on what, what they have. It is said that with the best of leaders, that when the job is done, the task is accomplished, the people will say, we did it ourselves. This is a quote from a famous Chinese uh, philosopher, Lao Tzu. Uh, real quick, 
our company focuses on five things. Water, which I'm the head of, uh, health education, farming methods. We have where I'm, the data that I am going to be discussing is actually coming from our rural development training center uh, area, that, that district right around there. Another thing that we work on is um, education. We provide scholarships for disadvantaged kids. In the past, we built one school, and uh, if you have a, a lot of money or know a foundation who uh, is interested in helping sponsor schools, uh, construction of schools, I'd love to talk to you. And uh, the place that we work and live is economically depressed. One of the things we'd really like to get into is small factories or uh, micro enterprise. We live in um, southern China. So this is the, the map of China. And Yunnan province is this whole province here. Kunming is where I uh, studied Chinese. And now I live in a small place which is about halfway between Kunming and Hanoi, Vietnam. There's a lot of different peoples. Uh, they say tribal peoples. I think you call them First Nation peoples that live among the mountains, mountains of southern uh, Yunnan. The Dai people. Uh, beautiful people who live right along rivers. Uh, they are typically the most prosperous of the uh, tribal peoples, of the First Nation peoples. We have a lot of E that live in our neighborhood. About 5% of the people are E. The Miao, uh, I'm not sure in uh, Canada if you have Laotians. In uh, California, where I live, we have a lot of Laotians. If you uh, are familiar with the Laotians, they don't call themselves uh, Miao, they call themselves Hmong, but they're ethnically the same people just coming from uh, different <coughs> sides of the, the border. The Yao, uh, the Yao are an interesting people. The first time I saw a Yao person about uh, 20 meters away from me, she saw me and she ran. She turned stark white and ran. In, uh, in my two and a half years, actually, these are the only two women who have allowed me to take their picture. Uh, maybe they thought I was rich and available. I'm not quite sure. Um, but the uh, one on the left is giving me quite a sweet smile. I'm already taken, by the way, happily. And then 90% uh, of the people that we work among are called the Hani people. Uh, they typically live at about uh, two, between 15 and 2,000 meters on the uh, uh, this is their elevation, sorry, uh, along the mountains, typically around, right around the top of the mountains. And you can identify the people by the different costumes that they wear. Since most of the 90% of the people are Hani, I've taken quite a few pictures. This is the, the village leader. It's just an old fart. <laughs> and here's a girl drinking some nice filtered water. All right, the people that live among us are very low in education. It's compulsory that they have, oh, let me, let me just say, I'm gonna spend about half of my talk giving background. Um, I love these people. I enjoy working among them. And uh, the situation is probably not really familiar with you, so I thought I would just give a little bit of time uh, explaining what these people are like and what their situation is like before I get into my data. <clears throat> they are, uh, Compulsory is sixth, sixth grade. Uh, that's the old regulation. The new regulation that just uh, was put down this year, and so uh, it applies to this first school year, is uh, now ninth grade. But actually, when I meet people, uh, for example, I work mostly with government officials, engineers, and the likes, typically they only have a fourth grade education. Um, it's not because they're dumb, that's for sure. Some of the, the people with the lowest educations are the most intelligent people. It's just because of the economic and uh, situation, they just weren't able to, to go uh, to school. You also see even from this, uh, this picture, uh, there are more boys able to go, and that's a cultural uh, standard. If, if you only have a certain amount of money, uh, school is not free, by the way. If you only have a certain amount of money, you're going to send your firstborn boy to school. And so predominantly, they are uh, just the boys that get to go. I shouldn't say it's not like 90%, 10% as this picture you might think. It's more like 60-40. Uh, 
They're sustenance farmers, uh, farming the terraced hills. It's a very interesting community. Uh, there is a quite an interesting mixture of primitive methods and yet modern technologies. Here is a man who is using his tractor is a water buffalo, but what is he doing? He's talking to his friend on the cell phone. That is a very interesting combination. Now most people do, by the way, have electricity. Um, not most, but a lot of people have TVs. Uh, the, the village head almost always will have a TV, a uh, satellite dish, and a, some sort of machine to burn uh, what they call VCDs. It's kind of like a simplified DVD. They're extremely poor. Typical income is only about $300 per year. Our farm hands that work on our farm, we pay about $500, so I guess it pays to work for uh, uh, an NGO, an in international NGO, but uh, that's still extremely low. Uh, we pay our workers about $1.80 a day. It's a rural, er rural area, uh, but it has a very high population density. This is a picture taken from the roof of my apartment and every Friday we have market day and everybody in the uh, surrounding district, all 30,000 people it seems like, come down to the uh, market day to buy their stuff and to sell their stuff. So even though the area is rural, every inch of land is covered in farmland. You see over here, if you look at this side here, this is farmland. Over here, all of this is farmland. You see this mountain back here is farmland. Go, by the way, go over that mountain. Uh, go over this mountain, go down the valley, go up to the peak of the next one, that's Vietnam. So that's how close we are to Vietnam. Every, every inch of land is taken for farming. So that's what I mean by po high population density. All right, it's also remote and difficult to reach. Where we live, it's four to five miles away from a major city. Um, it is then from our town, it is about two hour walk up to the mountains, to the uh, villages, that's a typical. Mountains are, or excuse me, the, the villages are on the top of these mountains typically. And access is only by earth and roads. I don't know of any villages actually where they have any, any sort of a paved road. So that makes it actually very difficult for me to drive my uh, expensive SUV. I do use my SUV, by the way, for uh, real purposes, as opposed to most uh, Americans who drive their SUVs in town. Uh, we have a four-wheel drive SUV, and as you can see from this road, we use it. Health conditions. They have an extremely high uh, infant mortality rate of 10%. This is what the government has told us. This is published literature. Uh, speaking to some people, they will say, oh no, it's not that at all. Speaking to other people, they say, oh, it's much higher. But the government has publicized that it's 10% among these tribal people. By and large, the villages are very uh, dirty, poorly kept, they also lack a basic health knowledge. I was very surprised. Now, how would you, if your baby has diarrhea, what would you do? You probably, if it's severe diarrhea, you'd probably get some uh, thing off the shelf, uh, some sort of a saline solution almost, uh, to get back salts and uh, sugars and liquid back into the body. Well, in this culture, it is believed that the reason the baby is going diarrhea is because it has too much water. And so they do not give children who have diarrhea any fluids until the diarrhea stops. And that itself may be a, a contribution, a significant contribution. Another example of uh, poor basic health is uh, the cleaning rag. I have just a quick little story. One day I was watching somebody and they had, a, they had a rag in their pocket and they pulled it out, uh, a family, this was a rest, at a restaurant, excuse me, 
and a family had just gotten up because they had finished eating, and he, the gentleman used the rag to wipe down the table. Okay? Now, the food, there was food on the table, of course, there was dirt on the table, and there had been flies on the table. He wiped, uh, wiped it down, put the rag back in his pocket. Then I ordered uh, some pork, uh, some fried pork for lunch, and he got out that same rag and wiped down my plate because it had been sitting there a while. I guess it was dusty. He then got some meat, and be before he chopped it up on the wood block, he wiped it down with that rag. Then he chopped it up, and he put it onto that plate, which was now clean because he wiped it. Then when the oil was hot and ready to fry, he poured it in, and now that, rag, uh, that uh, plate has what on it? It has juices and blood and such. And so he got that rag out and wiped it clean. <laughs> then after the food was done frying, he put the meat back on that plate. Now, does anybody see any sort of health problems? <laughs> they do too. I, I've, taught this same, I've taught this to them, and they are all, everybody is gagging and saying, no, that's wrong, you can't do that, that's, you can't do that. But there's some sort of, and, and maybe we all do this. You know, we preach one thing, but we live another thing. But this is something that we see all the time. And of course, um, running water is, a, is a, uh, something that we rich people in the West enjoy. And so toilets, uh, if they have them, don't have spigots to wash our hands with. And so another uh, health problem, of course, is just washing hands. So as you can imagine, uh, from this kind of negative uh, description of health conditions that I've gone over so far, the uh, worms and diarrhea are extremely common. They also have minimally trained uh, medical personnel. And I would also say that they have something that I call worldview complications. They uh, traditionally believe that diseases are not caused by cause and effect, they're caused by spirits. So these people are what you call animists, which means that the spirits animate uh, all of us and everything. And so when some, a child is sick, it is time to sacrifice to the idol. It is not necessarily time to uh, give the child an aspirin or, or antibiotics or, or whatever. So there's also a lot of worldview complications. Now, I have to say here that the Chinese government is working very hard uh, to, to educate the people of what's going on and you know, scientific ways. But you know, it seems like uh, there's still some things that just don't change. All right, environmental conditions. They have extremely uh, steep slopes. You see these two ladies here who are, they're actually farming. And your guess is as good as mine, but it looks like about a 45 degree slope that they're farming upon. And you can see in the background all the rice terraces. The only place where there are not uh, rice terraces is where it is extremely steep and it's just physically not possible. Uh, some people actually tie themselves in and almost like rappel down to uh, farm. That's how, uh, how they use their land. So <clears throat> deforestation is uh, pretty extreme. About 30 years ago, I was told that this whole mountainside was covered in trees, that there was no rice terraces. But with a population explosion in the 1960s, so that would be 40 years ago, um, they, they just had a, a population explosion. And as a result, they needed rice. And if you had to choose between uh, having a forest or having life, you might also do the same thing. They cut down their uh, forests and put in rice terraces. And so you see this whole area, which used to be a forest, is probably, what, about 90% uh, rice terraces. On top of that, they have very nice uh, amount of rain. They have between 1,000 and 2,000 millimeters per year which is, is wonderful. You can see all the water in the terraces provides luscious green rice terraces that are, are relatively productive. However, uh, overpopulation, deforestation, lots of rain, what does that spell? It spells massive erosion. And it's not uncommon that our, the road between our house and uh, the big city is uh, wiped out. Fortunately, the governor of uh, our prefecture lives just south of us, and so uh, 
he makes sure that the road is open because he needs to get back and forth to work. So there is some uh, conveniences of living near the uh, governor. Okay, social conditions. Why do they live on the side of hills? Why would you live on the side of hills? Well, historically, they have been uh, pushed that way. The majority people have pushed the minority to the worst parts of the land. It's only been about the last 50 years. Now, you have, there's a lot of uh, people who would love to discredit the communist government, but I would say that they've been doing a, a pretty darn good job. They've been trying now uh, in a number of areas very aggressively to get people out of the, the hills where there's all these problems and into the flatlands. The problem is that there's just not enough flatland for the population. There's also a lot of inner village strife. And, you know, when I was a kid, I always kind of grew up with the idea that uh, First Nation people and tribal people had perfect harmonious relationships. Well, I learned when I started working in China, they're just like me and, and my community that I grew up in. There's politics and there's a lots of crap. And you might hate your neighbor. Uh, and so there isn't this unified teamwork all the time. There's a lot of strife and a lot of bitterness and a lot of work that could get done that doesn't get done just because I don't like my next door neighbor and you know he thinks I'm a jerk or he stole my pig or whatever. All right. And then another problem is just social is a uh, social problem is poor maintenance practices. Uh, I think a lot of that is just from hopelessness. They just don't keep uh, good maintenance of some of their pipelines and other things. Gosh. How many people here just live for change? Uh, these folks are living on the edge. You know, the difference between them and uh, not having enough food may just be a small plot of land. If that small, if, if a foreigner comes in and, or for example, an alien comes here and tells you, hey, stop growing wheat or rice, try this. You know, and you've never seen it before, you may also say, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Well, they're very resistant to change. They're a very traditional society. They like what they are, have been doing. They don't want to change. One last comment about social conditions is the issue of face. I find this, I, I think they understand face. I'm talking about this as a condition, not as a problem. I don't understand the issue of face. The, there's a story about saying the right thing that I want to tell you. I was with, uh, when we, uh, let me back up. When we were going around and sampling water, we were also asking them about their health conditions. Every village that we went to said, oh, there is no infant mortality rate. I don't know of any children who have ever died in this community. And every village, well, until we got to uh, village number five is what we call it. They, the guy kind of pulled us aside and said, you know, it's not 10%, it's 60%. Well, after we did the analysis of their water, their E. coli was uh, 1,000 uh, E. coli per 100 milliliters. It was by far the worst. The next time we sampled, by the way, it was 1,500. Um, <clears throat> so I went to the government official and I said, look, you know, the government official, the, the standard says 10%. This community is telling me it's actually 60%. Their water is really polluted. I want to work in this village. Anything wrong with what I said? The government, uh, my uh, government official, she kind of said, oh, yeah, really? Oh, good, uh-huh. Who was that you talked to? Oh, OK, uh-huh, yeah. The next time we went there, that guy was nowhere to be found. I called him up. He wouldn't return my calls. What had I done wrong? I had embarrassed my friend at the government office because I had told her, one, you had told me 10%. It's 60%. And what I don't mean to do is what I do. I point my right, self-righteous finger right in their nose and tell them that they're wrong. Well, that's a story about face. I'm learning. You know, I just need to be a lot more careful and, I'll, and think a lot differently than the way I grew up. It may be no problem with you. It sure is a problem for me. Government conditions. I think that the government is, you know, people ask me, oh, is, is the government really trying to help those people? 
Yeah, it's their, it's their families. It's their, it's their land. They really want to help. But every one of the government officials I met, I think, feel despair. You know, there is just, there's not enough training for the people, there's not enough money to do the projects we want, and there's just a feeling of hopelessness. Never had anybody say this to me, but I feel like they say this to me. Hey, buddy, if you're not gonna fix a problem, don't go and tell me the problem. You tell me the problem, I'm responsible to fix it. I'd rather not know about the problem. And I'm not badgering them, it's just the reason they feel that way, I think, is because there is a hopelessness. <coughs> they have been developing, you know, China is very famous for developing super fast. If you look at the development, it's almost all on the East Coast. It's almost all in the cities. We live in the interior of China, a long way away from where massive development is happening. When you look at Shanghai, you know, or Beijing. Now, these are amazing first world cities. You know, you, when you go there, you don't think you're in, you know, it's definitely nicer than LA where I was. Uh, there are wonderful new cities. But it, that hasn't necessarily reached the countryside. And I think their idea is hopefully that they'll focus on the cities and then it will kind of trickle down. Nepotism is a, is a fancy word for caring about yourself and your family first before others. Uh, you know, government officials, they all do that, right? I do that. Do you care about your kids first? I mean, if it comes down to it, I, I think just what shocked me, though, is just how gross it is. I mean, it, it just amazed me. Uh, we work in one village where the one guy, he's the number three guy in the county, and he's got money. The guy next to him is dying of tuberculosis, and, you know, it, it's just, he's pathetically poor. And the, the, in, the social injustice of it, I guess, is what really uh, gets to me. The uh, government, 10 years ago, uh, they decided that they were going to make sure that every people, every village, rather, had water. So they spent the last 10 years just focusing on getting clean water, or getting water, rather, to the villages. They put in a massive amount of piping systems. Some places they didn't have enough money. They put in uh, canals. They just didn't want people to be having to cart it uh, on their shoulders. <coughs> I, just before I left, I was told that the, the new regulation or the new goal is to now provide quality water. So the emphasis in China right now has turned to water quality. So I hope, I hope, I hope uh, that uh, I have landed in China just at the right time to help work with water quality problems. All right, some of the water conditions uh, is what I'm going to talk about next. I think one of the major problems with, uh, with water is that they don't have anybody responsible. They don't have what I would call a water master. Somebody making sure that the water is clean, that the pipes are working correctly. Now there are gentlemen like, like this man, you'll find them in every village, who quote unquote is responsible. But really if you ask somebody who's responsible in the village, they all will say, oh we all are responsible. Well, what happens when everybody is responsible for something? Well, you know, I've got to cook food. Hans, would you take care of it? Well, Hans is busy, you know, running this conference. Oh, would you take care of it? And, and soon enough, you know, nobody's responsible, right? And the, the other problem is that these water masters, if they exist, and they know that they're responsible for it, they're not really well trained. And so because of that, there's a lot of improperly developed springs. Find that people are just are not trained and they're just doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have. So here's a spring. You know, this is a, a bamboo pole. And they've notched out, you know, how there's the joints in bamboo. Well, maybe you don't, but there's joints in bamboo. They've kind of notched those out. And so the spring is somewhere here and they just kind of trough it down. Here's another spring. It's uh, the water is coming out of the mountain right here. And in here you can see a, a galvanized steel pipe. Here's another spring. This one looks really gross. Here's a, a spring which 
I, I would love to talk to somebody who's really familiar with developing springs. We have an engineer with our company who develops springs, and he said this is a really tricky one to, d to develop properly. Reason being is the water just kind of leaks out of this whole area right here. And so what they did is they have these kind of grooves cut in this trench, and the water kind of basically leaks into uh, this trench and then flows on down into the village. Another problem that uh, you can't really see is, but there's farmland right up here. And that gets me to my next point. There is quite often, almost all the, the springs that I have been to, there is a farmland. There is farmland above the spring. Now, this is a great picture because it is right above the spring. Now, they, they use DDT. They use a lot of pesticides. But really what I'm more concerned with is that they use night soil. I think night soil might be an American term. Uh, human fertilizer on their farmland. So if you have basically a, a, an, an open pit toilet here is effectively what it becomes. Just uh, 10, 20 meters above your spring. What do you think the uh, E. coli count is in your spring? I think it's going to come. Okay, uh, let me just kind of burn through some of these. Uh, what time do I have uh, until? I'm okay. Here's just some um, more springs. By the way, this, this is the same one that I showed you just a second ago with a profile. Most of the springs that we found are, are poorly designed. They should have a, a cover on them with a, a vent uh, to let the air leak in. You want to cover them because you don't want all of the, the hillside to flow into this little uh, cistern here. And so this one is great because it has a cover. However, uh, there's no air vent and so you know it, it could get, if there was enough moss or whatever grows, it could actually seal and then you wouldn't be able to get any water out of it. Another problem you see here is that the pipe here, they use galvanized pipe everywhere, is broken. What do you do when your galvanized pipe is broken? Well, I run down to Home Depot and I buy a part. But I've got a credit card and I've got uh, a Home Depot. And uh, they stick a piece of plastic around a piece of wood and shove it in the hole. So they use, predominantly, they use galvanized pipes. and. Uh, the galvanizing is usually lasts about 10, 15 years. And so it's very common as we're walking through villages, we'll see pipes that are broken. And here they've just shoved a, a piece of wood in the hole to uh, minimize the leakage. See a lot of maintenance problems here. The lid is put on sideways. Uh, the bottom here is broken and hasn't been repaired. Now, this one's got a couple of different problems. One, the, the lid is closed. Two, the, originally this was a, a barrier wall put up to, if there was any uh, flow off of the farmland, it should have allowed the water to go around the cistern. But instead, it's built up over time uh, because of landslides and such. And now any rain that comes or any water that flows over the farmland just flows directly into the, the cistern. All right, they use both open channels, such as this uh, bamboo one, and here's a concrete lined one. And they seem to have some uh, beautiful duplicates. And also, they also use open and closed cisterns. Here is a typical uh, open cistern. What I mean by open is that they can freely uh, use a ladle and grab the water right out of that. A number of these type of cisterns will also have uh, some sort of a uh, pipe sticking right out of the wall. I have very rarely seen any valves on any of those pipes. Here's another example. Here you have the, the pipe sticking through the wall and so when you need water you can just go over there and grab it. Uh, one problem with open cisterns like this is you can just lay your stuff on the side. Uh, this is, anybody recognize this? This is for pesticides. 
Uh, I can't tell you what was in it. You know, it could have been DDT. It could have been any sort of na number of nasty uh, chemicals. Uh, somebody was washing their clothes and they just laid their soap here. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it falls in every once in a while. And so there's just a lot of problems of keeping your cisterns open like this. Okay, this is that same uh, cistern that I showed you just a minute ago. It uh, has a canal which is about two, three, kilo three kilometers long, uh, open canal, and then it comes to a, a common area here where the lady comes and ladies come and wash their clothes, or uh, they come and take a sh people come and take a shower, or people come and get their uh, drinking water all from the same source. Here's an example of a closed cistern. Again, no, no valves, uh, but they do have quite a bit of water. And uh, in most villages, actually, a lack of water is not the problem now. And just another picture of a closed cistern. Again, you see that uh, they don't look like they're in the best repair, kind of old and worn out. That's par for the course. There really uh, isn't a, any sort of scheduling. I haven't met anybody who uses a scheduled cleaning uh, if something falls in, as uh, this is the case here, uh, just before we got there, something fell in, uh, they'll drain it and they'll scoop something out. But there really isn't any sort of clean, uh, cleaning schedule. We kind of uh, played the, the great white knight and we're telling them all the problems that they had uh, about how dirty their cisterns were. And so some of the guys got the idea of, well, hey, we need to at least make it look clean. And so they whitewashed it. Um, you know, it's white, so it's clean kind of idea. So again, just I'm not making fun of them. I'm not degrading them. I'm just saying that some of the, the understandings are just not there. And so that's one of the things that we want to do is not, I'm not trying to put them down. I'm just trying to say that there's just a basic understanding uh, problem. Most people drink uh, fresh water as opposed to boiled water. That is a convenience thing. If they're working a long way away in their rice terraces, uh, they can't just boil water out there while they're working. And you can see here a couple of uh, bamboo ladles. So they just kind of grab and drink. So that means if you've got a cold, tomorrow I've got a cold. All right, what we did is we went out and sampled water uh, all over the place. And what I want to show you is some of uh, my E. coli counts. Now what we used is we used a, a membrane filtration technique to sample, uh, to, to uh, pull the water through a, uh, a filter. And then we put that filter, uh, well, let me back up. We used something from Hawk. Uh, Hawk is a company. And they have a method, a Kali 24 method, which says that it's approved by EPA. Basically, we needed something that was somewhat reliable and pretty cheap because we just don't have that much money. And I just want to show you a few Petri dishes uh, where, and give you an idea of what these things look like. Okay, here's, uh, by the way, these pictures, are, these are pictures, they're not as good as uh, seeing them. So it's, sometimes it's kind of hard and maybe impossible for you uh, folks in the back. But there is a difference, as the, the previous gentleman just uh, talked about, there's quite a significant difference between total coliform and E. coli. Uh, this count, this method, what it does is it, uh, if it is a total coliform, the, the, col the colony will be red. If it's a E. coli colony, then it will be blue. And so here you can see a couple, or actually five, different uh, colonies that are red in color. I think you have to use your imagination. And so there are no E. coli here, but there are five uh, total coliform. Here is another one where, there, again, there is no E. coli, but there is a lot of red dots. And each of these dots represents one individual uh, coliform, which, of course, what happens is it, it, it's incubated for 24 hours and becomes a colony that's visible. Okay, here is uh, a Petri dish where the total coliform is too numerous to count. In other words, I have pity on the students who did this data, and I told them, don't bother trying to count all of these things. But it did have nine E. coli. And boy, it's almost impossible for me to see it even. Well, here's one that's pretty clearly uh, blue. And there's some other ones around. 
Again, blue means E. coli. Here, the uh, total coliforms were quite small at this point, but the E. coli were quite large. So you can see almost all of these larger colonies are E. coli. And here's a, a water that you really don't want to be drinking. Um, this is too numerous to count for, for both uh, coliform, total coliform and E. coli. Again, this is drinking water. So we conducted this experiment last spring, uh, I should say spring of 2000 to be clear, and we went to the, uh, the villages around our training center, and I, I live right near our training center. We sampled, we went to 34 different villages, there's about 100 villages in our community. We sampled 17 springs, 34 in-village cisterns, 7 in-village combination springs and villages. Some people. Uh, their village is fortunate and the water actually comes out of their, uh, out of a spring that's located in their village. Um, most of them uh, have about a kilometer or two kilometers away is their spring. And then there are five different villages that don't have a piping system yet. They just have a, a canal, whether it be earthen canal or a cement lined canal. We only tested for E. coli. Uh, we had done a preliminary uh, assessment and we looked at arsenic and E. coli and E. coli was so high we didn't even bother to look at anything else yet. We sampled, uh, also significant is we sampled before it started to rain and after it started to rain and, and I'll explain to you why that that's important in a minute. Okay, I think from the previous talk I can just skip through this. E. coli is just an indicator. It's not actually the, the E. coli that kills you. This is the E. coli that's a fecal, uh, uh, indication of fecal contamination. I'm going to skip over this. The World Health Organization standard is that there should be less than one fecal coliform, less than one per 100 milliliters. <coughs> okay, we sampled 24 of, excuse me, <laughs> 41 cisterns. And um, we wanted to, to see what the situation was in those. And what we're looking at now is the data from villages with pipe systems. Okay, so in other words, from the spring to the village, there was a pipe. As opposed to a, a, an open canal or the spring being in the village. We found that the average spring concentration had 46 E. coli uh, per 100 milliliters. That's the average. After uh, it, it came from the spring to the cistern, that increased only a little bit uh, to 48 E. coli per 100. So the in-village cistern results, in general, this is now the first two points of data were just the averages. We found that two consistently met the World Health Organization. Now this is 41 cisterns. Two of them met the World Health Organization consistently. Five of them were between 1 and 10. 28 between 10 and 100. Five consistently ab above 100. And one of those was consistently above 1,000 E. coli. This is their drinking water. Now, if you don't have a piping system, you, uh, your village relies on canal water. Well, these guys have farms. These guys have water buffaloes. They have wild animals. Any number of things that could uh, kind of pollute their water. And so because of that, you see that there is quite a bit higher E. coli concentration. These are the results from the, the cistern in the villages that do not have any, um, any they do, do not have a canal. Uh, village TS1 consistently, or on the average rather, uh, had uh, 1,500. And in fact, it had uh, always over greater than 1,000 E. coli. And you see between these five that the average is uh, about 370. It's a pretty dire situation. So just comparing these two between 46 and 370 <coughs> averages, you know, it, it makes sense to put in piping systems, that's for sure.
Then I, another thing I want to talk about briefly is the relationship between the farmland above the springs and the E. coli counts. I think that this is one of this is the chief problem, in my opinion, is the the habit of having farmland right above a spring. Here we have a the farmland, which is this area here. You can see how it's been terraced. You have the spring right here, and then this is the cistern where they get their water. This is uh, usually uh, their shower. Okay, now. This data is uh, a little bit confusing, so let me go ahead. And what, what I did is I'm looking at the data uh, for before it rained, okay, and after it rained. So this square here is for one cistern, uh, excuse me, one spring before it rained. So before it rained at this spring, the concentration was about 55. E. coli. After the rain season started, it went all the way up to 180. And you can see that that's very typical. Before the spring, uh, before the rain, it's low. After the rain, it's high. Before, before, after. Now there are a couple of exceptions, but almost all of them increase and increase drastically. So what does that tell us? Oh, one more before I go into what does that tell us. Uh, similarly, this is now for the, the cistern data. And let me back up one. This is for the spring source. The average, uh, again, is tw about 25 before it rains, about 69 after it started to rain. Likewise, at the cistern is very similar, 20, about 22, and then after it rained, about 63. So what's happening here? Farmers apply human manure to, this, to the uh, farms. These farms happen to be, some of the farms happen to be above the springs. The rain season comes and it washes fertilizer off the farmlands. Fecal contamination gets washed into the spring and into the cisterns. Consequence, you got a high E. coli count. And as a result, uh, well, that, that does not uh, prove anything, uh, but it does indicate uh, very possibly the possibility of uh, transmission of diseases. How much contamination occurs after the spring? Now, in this one, what I did is I looked at pairs of springs that were connected to a cistern in a village. Okay, so you have spring A is attached to cistern A. And this is from 14 different pairs of springs and cisterns. Again, you'll see on the average there is an increase. All right? The average at the spring is about 22. And at the cistern in the village, it's about 39, 38. Okay? Some of these are pretty much flat lines. Uh, you can see some of these down here. Not a great increase. Some of these are dramatic. They just go up like rocket ships. So there's, while there is some of them that are not impressive, some of them are quite exceedingly ex impressive. Uh, the native village A in Township 1 we went back, we sampled at this location three times. The first time the spring only had, uh, it had had the highest amount, it had 35. At the cistern it had 71. Then the next two times it was quite low, but then the, uh, the levels at the cisterns were very high. Likewise in the uh, township one, the main village, at the spring was clean. Apparently there was no fecal contamination. That's great, let's celebrate then why on earth is there, what's going on in the cistern? What's happening between the spring and the cistern? So let me summarize here. By and large, the springs are already polluted. Okay, 24 E. coli 
per 100 milliliters is still far beyond what the World Health Standard is. And by the way, the, the Chinese standard and the World Health Organization standard, the US standard, Canadian standard, is all the same. It should be zero. We see an increase in the E. coli concentrations occurring somewhere between the spring and the cistern. Yellow. And this is probably a result of poor habits, is my guess. Again, I would, I would love to be the fly on the wall to know what their habits are. I'm, at this point, I am theorizing. I have not been there. But we have seen the use of uh, unclean utensils. I've shown you some pictures of those. Uh, they're open in these villages. They use open cisterns. So there is a great chance for uh, somebody to drop the, the ladle uh, on the ground where there's been pigs and then use it to scoop. There's just a lot of opportunities with open cisterns. And then they also have uh, a lack of valves. And so again, it's just an opening for any sort of contamination to get in. All right, recommendations. I think one of the, the chief recommendations that, that we have, and, and this is what we're trying to do, we want to do desperately, is to educate people. It seems that, you know, that a lot of times we hear the saying, you know, I grew up with this water. And what they're telling me is, I survived, so it must be clean. Well, part of the problem is there's this correlation problem. They don't understand that dirty water and the, the correlation between uh, public health and dirty water. They don't see it. And so, you know, the, the only solution I can think of is either beating them over the head um, or to educate them. And I prefer to educate them. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Another thing that they, by the way, um, about the water is uh, just like Colin was speaking the last time, uh, you know, you, they look at the water and they, they, they is it clean? Well. You know, if I walked up to you and I said, here, drink water, would you trust me? Well, I, you probably would, but, um, and I appreciate that. Um, but I did this to somebody uh, during one of our training sessions. I came out with three, three glasses of water. And I, asked, I told them they come from three different sources. One is water that came out of our GAC filter, which us as foreigners, that's what we drink. The second is out of the tap, which has an average of somewhere between three to seven coliform per 100 milliliters. The other was the toilet. Now, it's a, it's a Western toilet. It's not the, you know, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it didn't have little floaties in there. I mean, it, but it was the, it was after I, I flushed it and I sniffed it, it it's, it, you know, it, it looked good. I told them that. Which one is which? They couldn't tell. Nobody guessed right. I mean, statistically, somebody should have guessed right. But basically, there was 20 people there, and they all like, I don't know. You can't tell the difference. And that's my point. You know, you, they, they look at it. It's cool. It's coming out of the mountain. And it's clear. So it's got to be clean. But man, that, that place is like a toilet. When you have farmland that they use human fertilizer on, you might as well be drinking toilet water. And a lot of times when you have 1,500 uh, E. coli in your water, that's basically about the same. All right, I think, uh, by the way, let me take a drink. I think that uh, we really need to train water masters. It's clean, it's not toilet water. Um, I would love to be able to train some men uh, and women, it would be great, uh, to, to really understand water. To be able not just to put pipes together, but to discern whether the water really is clean. And somebody who's responsible when something breaks to take care of it. But before we, we clean up water, what do we need to do? We need to prevent contamination. One uh, Just a simple thing is when they go back to uh, you know, re renew the, the system, they, they put in a new piping system. I would vote strongly that they use plastic, something that's going to last longer. The, just about every system I've seen has been broken uh, just because the, the galvanized pipes break so quickly. More importantly, they need to use closed systems. 
You know, right now they just have an open system. Everywhere it's open, 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 which leads to contamination, contamination, contamination. They also need to do something to regularly disinfect it. Now, I, I'm a little bit afraid about using chlorination. That's why I put a question mark there, because this is water coming from springs, which may be relatively high in organics. Uh, you know, what do you do? You, you disinfect it, but then you give them cancer from all the THMs? I don't know. But um, I would, you know, I'd rather them get, well, what, what do you do? You, you ask them to get cancer in 30 years, or do you, you save the kids now? You know, it's one of those things. Um, so I, I would say that maybe uh, disinfection would be a good thing. I think also regular scheduled maintenance. We need to have those uh, water masters going out there and making sure that everything is working properly. They need to make sure that there's no farms above springs wherever possible. But you know, a lot of times that's just not possible. You have a spring, uh, I, we built a school four years ago in a village which is at the bottom of a hill and above their uh, village is another, or above their village is another village. And so there's farmland, there's village, farmland, spring, village is, is how it works. And so they have absolutely no choice. I mean, they, they get water that is right underneath a farm. Uh, I guess they could ask the rich foreigner to put in a 10 kilometer uh, pipeline to another source, but uh, that's probably not the best solution either. So where, wherever possible, to make sure there are no springs, uh, sorry, farms above the springs. If that can't be done, then there needs to be some sort of a wall or barrier put up so that when the rains come off of the farmlands, which have human fertilizer, then there is some sort of protection so the water does not get into springs. And then on top of that, let's put up some barriers so that any contamination that does occur can get cleaned up. So these are very simple people, very poor people, who do not have a lot of money, and there are thousands of villages. Our community has 100 villages in our, uh, excuse me, in our district. In our county, there are about five, uh, say that again. In our district, there are 100 villages. In our county, there are 1,000. In this area, general area, there are 5,000 villages. Well, 5,000 times $5,000 for each one. Um, we're gonna probably have to get the World Health Organization involved or, or uh, somebody very, very rich. So we have thought so far about something very simple as such as slow sand filters. Uh, however, uh, as, I, as I speak with Hans, and uh, other experts, one of the things that I would love to be able to do is to put in uh, a village treatment system into each of these. If it can be made affordable and effective and we can teach the people how to use it. Now, I think the, the yellow quill example, I'm looking forward to seeing this on Friday, so I can't speak it with any authority since I'm about as ignorant as they come about it. But what I do understand is that now you have people there who are taking responsibility, they're proud of their water. And that's great, you know? When people are proud about their water and taking care, but taking their own initiative, then, then you're assured that it's not gonna just be broken down. It's not the white man's water system. It's not the rich guy who just gave it to us, it's ours. And so therefore, they're gonna take care of it. Well, that's the end of my talk. I, I really wanna communicate uh, thanks to these gentlemen here, uh, not the white guy. Uh, yet. The, the other four. These are the guys who in some ways kind of stuck their neck out and said, yeah, you can go out and sample. Um, the Chinese government, you know, is really sensitive. Um, I'm an American. It seems that the American government and American people in general, or I should say the United States government, uh, the United States government a lot of times seems to like to pick on Chinese government. And I'm not communicating that. I'm not trying to communicate that in any way. Uh, these are the guys who, who said, yeah, you can go and you can do your studies. They helped me, they went with me, they built the relationships for me so that I could go out there. So I'm greatly appreciated. And in fact, this man right here, I live on his land. So uh, he's not only my government, local government official, he's also my landlord. Here's Alan. Uh, this is the guy who did it all. 
Uh, you, I would invite any of you who would love to come to, uh, ch to China to come and visit me in my village. It's uh, amazing what this guy did. For three months, every, just about every day, he was hiking two miles up or two uh, hours up to sample water and two hours back. Um, in, some, in one case, I, I went to one of these villages, the furthest village out that he went to, you know, and I was dead after I got back. Not only did I have to go um, for, well, I'm, I'm kind of an old fart and getting fatter. I don't know what it is, just out of shape, not like this guy. It took me three hours to hike there. I had to cross one river. He didn't tell me about the river, and so I had to get down in my underwear uh, to cross the river and then put my clothes back on and go back up the side. Uh, watching the uh, native people laugh at me in my underwear was quite uh, a funny story. But this guy was the guy who uh, took all the data for me. And then, of course, Hans, um, I met Hans in Kinming, and he uh, encouraged me. He gave me a lot of insights. Uh, he's been very helpful. So I thank the, the Safe Drinking Water uh, Foundation for all their technical support. I've asked him a bunch of annoying questions. And I thank you for your attention.